Hello, everyone, and welcome to AFI Docs 2020 presented by AT&T. My name is Malene Khan, and I'm a programmer with the festival. Before we begin, I just want to thank all of our supporters, particularly our presenting sponsor, AT&T, our AFI members, as well as you, our audience. Thank you so much for watching. Um, you should have all just seen the absolutely fascinating film Coded Bias that premiered at Sundance in what feels like five year long months ago. Um, but I'm so pleased to have uh, filmmaker Shalini Kantaya here with me today to discuss her film. Um, thank you so much, Shalini, for being here um, and letting us include this incredible and thought provoking film in AFI Docs. Um, I think uh, one of the things that makes this film so affecting is that while many of us are aware of the kind of invisible use of algorithms, I think we are less informed about how they affect us beyond marketing purposes. Um, and your film really underscores uh, the need and incredible difficulty um, with legislation keeping ahead of technology. And um, while computers themselves are dispassionate and unbiased, the coders really are not. And this is, um, it was you know, really thought provoking, uh, revelatory film uh, behind that topic. Um, but how did you come to this particular topic? Um, well, first off, thanks so much for having me. And thank you to everyone who took the time to watch this film that is um, in, so engaging, I think, and, and has a lot of relevance for the world that we're living in as we turn to technology as decision makers in these important systems. Um, I knew nothing about this topic um, <laughs> two years ago when I began. And I started to watch sort of TED Talks by people like Kathy O'Neill and Joy Bolamwini. And I was just amazed. First of all, I feel like in the making of this film, I really came to terms with all the invisible decision makers in the forms of algorithms that we are interacting with every day that are making decisions about who gets hired, who gets health care, how long someone spends in prison. And as we increasingly sort of shift our autonomy to machines, just how little we understand about how these systems work. And sort of they become this sort of big magic of mathematics. And so I really got inspired through this group of sort of badass mathematicians and scientists, mostly women, mostly women of color, who both had expertise in this field, you know, very renowned. I think there's seven PhDs in my film, but also had the experience of being an outsider. They were a woman, they were of color. Somehow the system was not optimized for them. And so they were really the people who helped draw back the curtain and help a lay person like me really see that um, how, how algorithms can be as racist and sexist and anti-Semitic as we are because they're replicating our data. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, the, it really, uh, is powerful to see all of these women of color, um, kind of leading this battle. Um, and, uh, I, I did wonder about, uh, cause it seems like this is really a topic that you probably have, um, a lot of people who don't like the fact that you're exploring it. You're coming up against some kind of big players. Did you, um, encounter any resistance in terms of people wanting to be involved or wanting to speak on this topic? I think, um, yes, I feel that, uh, Let's just uh, start by saying that my last film was on um, the economic opportunity of solar energy. So I sort of um, am used to sort of speaking truth to power. But I have never felt the way that big tech is entrenched in liberal communities, in progressive politics, is sort of unseen. And because they have a reputation of being always in the direction of progress, always in the direction of sort of forward thinking society, I feel like we have a harder time challenging these big companies. And I think in this current pandemic, we're becoming even more reliant on these companies. And they've sort of created a system where we think there's only one way of doing technology in this sort of surveillance capitalism model where they're 
taking our data and making predictions about us. And what I learned in the making of this film is there are actually a lot of possible models that we're not exploring because of the dominance of big tech. Um, I think that just by way of the power that big tech has in our society, it is a danger to our democracy that we don't yet have sort of the levers in play to balance that kind of power. And it's a power that is totally one-sided and in the hands of very few people that are making decisions about systems that impact all of us. And so I, I really feel that it's time that we change and open up a dialogue. I mean, that being said, I have to say, I'm really surprised about how many people in big tech uh, came to me after my Sundance premiere and said how much they love the film. And that is to say that at these big companies that there are a lot of great people who are very well intentioned, who are extremely bright, who want to do the right thing, and who are aware of these unintentional consequences of their actions. And um, they're looking for us to give them reason to engage with these big issues. Right. Um, I guess that's kind of like IBM changing their facial recognition exactly. software after Joy pointed out its problems. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's really wonderful that it's having that kind of impact. Um, and you know, I think uh, you are locked into this very key moment where the change really is happening. And it's so great at the end of the film to see where, um, you know, facial recognition software is being banned in certain states. Um, have, has there been, have there been any advancements since um, your film has been released? Absolutely. I mean, we're seeing, um, you know, sort of the, the cities and places where tech people live. You know, we're talking about San Francisco, Oakland, Somerville, Massachusetts, which is a big tech hub. So we're seeing that the cities that, um, that are the tech hubs of the United States being actually the first to ban these technologies in their own communities. Mm -hmm. And so that should teach us a lot about how we should all be thinking about how uh, slowing this sort of, you know, let's adapt it without thinking about it technology. Mm -hmm. The thing that I worry about is what we're seeing with COVID-19 is we're having a moment where we could, we have the potential to pass what I'm calling sort of the Patriot Act of technology. Where sort of big tech is saying, we have all the solutions, we can predict the future. And even a lot of these models that we're using to figure out how many, that are making life and death you know, decisions about how many ventilators are de deployed, are being made by algorithms that we don't actually understand, that we're not sure how accurate they are. And so it's more important than ever that we sort of vet and that we don't rush to to adapt technologies like this new technology that they're doing around um, contact tracing and wanting to track who we've been in contact with and our temperature. Like mm -hmm. we have to think uh, carefully about some of the race to adapt technologies to meet the mm -hmm. crisis because they may not actually have the outcomes we want when we know that COVID-19 is sort of affecting disparately, you know, communities of color. It's um, that may not have these high-tech cell phones. It's um, affecting um, uh, disparately elderly people who also may not be in this high-tech sort of, um, mm -hmm. you know, in this high-tech group that may be adapting this. So we have to actually, um, think more carefully about human-centered solutions. And that, that is my worry is as we fight back around facial recognition, that these other sort of technologies can be quickly adapted without knowing what these unintended consequences are. Right. Um, I, I guess that brings up a, another uh, interesting th thing that I found about your film, which was the decision to um, include the woman from China mm -hmm. and her kind of positive, more more positive uh, outlook in terms of uh, the 
way that facial recognition is being used there, even with the knowledge that it's being used in other kind of nefarious ways. Mm -hmm. Was that, I mean, how did you find her and what was the kind of decision to include that storyline? Well, I really was looking for a counterpoint and also China, um, obviously the two leaders of AI are are the US and China. Mm. And China, we see it adapting in this model that they have unfettered access to everybody's data. And mm. they're creating this sort of way, this incredibly sophisticated surveillance state. And the thing that I feel that her, this, this Chinese residence um, uh, sort of gives us a skater, sort of gives us, is this idea of like, this is great, this is efficient. I don't have to spend time getting to know someone. I can rely on a score, on an algorithmic score. And even though that seems as some far off reality, I want, it was important for me to put it in the film because we all have this part of ourselves that's like, this is more convenient. This is saving me time. I don't have to think about this. I'm mindly slipping into these systems without thinking what role it's playing, who's being left out. And so um, for me, it was sort of having a Black Mirror episode inside my, um, inside right. my <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it absolutely felt that way. <laughs> um, and I guess in the same kind of vein, you have uh, this conversation that Joy is having when she's pre being prepared to, for her hearing, where she's being told about how the technology is being used to capture criminals. And she has to kind of counter those positive um, uses um, with these, you know, the potential for it to be used negatively. Um, and uh, the hearing itself was so fascinating to see and to see um, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez kind of just, you know, another woman of color just running with it uh, in a really wonderful way. Um, but it does kind of, uh, it, it makes it look like this is like a left progressive issue. Do you feel like it is um, very left or right in terms of um, where it's aligned? Well, I'll tell you, um, in that, in, in the, that scene, um, we included, Jim Jordan, and I, re I was at that hearing, and I, I remember Jim Jordan is um, very right Republican, almost was minority leader. And there was a moment during the hearing where he said, wait a minute, the FBI has a database of 117 million Americans, half the population of the country that they're getting from licensed database and no one in an elected official, no elected official gave the word that the FBI could do this. And for Jim Jordan to say this was such a sort of a moment where even I stood back and I realized that it's not even right wing Republicans that are adapting these technologies. The police, the FBI, law enforcement are picking up these tools without anybody in an elected position giving any kind of guidance or governance on how these technologies will be deployed. And to me, that is a huge danger in, in a democracy. And to have someone like Jim Jordan, a very right-wing Republican, bring this to light was a sign that this is not about left and right. This is actually about right and wrong right. in a democracy. And you can almost look to the future by looking at what's happening in the UK and seeing the facial recognition that's being used there. And have they made any sort of advancements um, in terms of? Yes, in the UK, they have actually made it legal to use real-time facial recognition. Um, Big Brother Watch is continuing to fight that law. And um, because it is becoming, as we saw in the film, uh, the new stop and frisk. In, in the making of the film, I think it, it took me, I think the first 50 times of watching that scene where you see a 14 year old school kid in school uniform being wrongly stopped and frisked by police officers wearing plain clothes. And I'm watching it thinking how I would react. I would literally, I, I, the fact that this kid is so respectful is such a, I, I, it was so um, disturbing to me 
And, and for a child to not understand why am I being stopped by the police? Mm -hmm. Um, And knowing what we know about wrongful identifications during the trial period, you know, I think they stopped over 2000 people wrongly. That's a conservative number from the UK report Mm -hmm. done by Big Brother Watch. So we have to be really careful about these situations. And I'm very concerned. Imagine what, what Silky Carlo, the ED of Big Brother Watch says, that the UK after 9-11 started having these, this giant CCTV network. And if they deploy real-time facial recognition, the nature of life and democracy could change. I live in a city like New York where we have a massive CCTV network. Mm -hmm. If all of those systems are using real-time facial recognition, and in the US I have no way of of knowing because we don't have laws that Mm -hmm. will allow that process to be transparent to me, Mm -hmm. um, that changes the the nature of life in a democracy. It changes things like, um, what happens if, if we're being surveilled when we're at a Freddie Gray protest, when we know that happened, right? Um, right? That's one of the things that, um, that uh, Elijah Cummings brought to light, that that technology was being used at a protest. And it starts to interfere with things like our right to assemble, our right, our freedom of association. So many rights that the constitution guarantees us can be sort of rolled back by these technologies when we're, when we're looking in the other direction. Wow, yeah, and in the UK, they've just kind of, it happened so gradually that you think they've just come to accept it. I don't know if it happened gradually. It happened through a process that was a little more transparent than it happened in the U.S. Okay. Um, because they have legislation, they have the GDPR, they have other legislation where people have rights. Mm-hmm. We have no rights in the U.S. when it comes to privacy, and that is a problem. We are literally living in a wild west when it comes to this kind of these kinds of new technologies that are governing the world. And um, what about, uh, is there any sort of movement in terms of uh, there being companies being sort of legislated to ensure that they have a diverse array of coders or, (laughs) I mean, is there some, or is that, are are these things that are happening all internally companies looking at their kind of coding teams and ensuring that they have kind of representation? Right. So um, Enjoy is really wonderful to speak about these things, I think part of it is that there's a lack of inclusion and that the people who are making these decisions are um, overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male. We know that 14% of AI researchers are women. I mean, that's an astounding statistic. Mm. Um, But even if these systems work perfectly on everyone, they still have the capacity for abuse. They still need oversight. They still need people in elected positions having some sort of oversight on how they're deployed. Because Mm -hmm. even if they can perfectly identify us, that just enables surveillance. Right. So um, I think there are two different sort of scenarios there. Um, We hope that tech companies are being more inclusive, but not just in terms of race and gender, but also in terms of class, in terms of life experience, in terms of people of, you know, who just have different experiences when we're building technologies that are supposed to be built for everyone. Mm. And we still have a long way to go, I think is the answer. And can I ask about Joy? I, she is really such a charming, wonderful subject. Um, and her, you know, her poetry and everything to be included. It's just um, this little group of women that comes together is so kind of empowering. Um, how, what is she doing now? Uh, how, where, what is she working on? How is the algorithmic justice league? <laughs> well, Joy is a firecracker and I can't keep up with everything that she's doing. Uh, but the Algorithmic Justice League is doing a lot of work, working, and we're, the filmmakers, is work, are, we are working with the Algorithmic Justice League, with the ACLU, with organizations like Anita B that seeks to bring more women and more inclusion and in technology um, to the forefront to sort of bring these issues about. Because, 
you know, it's a big learning curve. I, I, I think like I didn't talk to people for two years because I was scared I would go to a party and someone would ask me what I'm working on and my eyes would glaze over and I'm like, I'm talking about how machines can be racist and sexist. <laughs> um, and so there's a big learning curve for us to figure out why this matters to us. And, um, and I think for us, for me as a filmmaker, sort of figuring out how we can, one, fit, show traditional civil rights organizers and people who work on issues of equality, why this matters. So I feel like we have a big learning curve. Mm -hmm. And then um, there are all these wonderful organizations that we hope to rally around the film, um, because this is the first film that I know of around algorithmic justice, um, to really talk about how we can create solutions for the future. And then um, for anyone who uh, is watching this film who wants to somehow get involved, um, are there any organizations they can look to or websites you would recommend? Yes, you definitely want to check out the Algorithmic Justice League. They're doing a safe face pledge. Um, they're trying to get companies to um, uh, keep your facial recognition, not use facial recognition. There are movements uh, for Fight for the Future to ban facial recognition at music concerts uh, at, on college campuses and universities and in schools. And the ACLU is doing wonderful camp work to sort of ban facial recognition at the local and the state level. And as we sort of ban it at the local and the state level, we can sort of bring about, you know, I hope a first federal recognition regulation around these issues. What would you see that regulation looking like? Well, I'd love to see, um, I would love to see a federal ban on uh, government use of facial recognition. Um, mm. Until we know, until we know that it's fair, until we know it's accurate, until we know that there's some rules in place on how we use these technologies, I say we press pause. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, this is just uh, such a, you know, such a really incredible film. Uh, I learned so much. Um, and I think you're really getting this uh, topic out there in a wonderful way. Um, thank you so much for making it and uh, for letting us play it with AFI Docs um, and for being with me today. <laughs> thanks so much for having me and thanks for watching the film. Yeah.